Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Kalayim, Chapter 9, Halacha 6. This is the last Halacha. Today we're getting into the minimum measures of Kalayim. What's going to be the minimum part of Kalayim? And it's going to be talking about what is it when we connect this piece to that piece and we create it with a single stitch. Before we were talking about what happens if you tack a belt to a garment and you've connected it and you bind it together. Well, what's going to be the minimum measure of connection between this garment and that garment or between this and that that is going to connect it? And the Gemara does this often, wants to know what is the minimum measure for something. So the Mishnah starts off and it says that if someone stitches one garment to another with a single pass of a needle, it is not considered an attachment regarding the law for Tuma or for, uh, it's not subject for Kalayim. And someone who undoes that single knot, that single pass through on Shabbat is exempt. Now, why is that? Well, did you really create a permanent connection between this and that? I mean, what exactly is the malaha in in Shabbos, right? Was it sewing? Was it um, was it tying? So you didn't you didn't really make a permanent connection with a single pass, and it's not going to bite between this and that, and and that's that's really the deep key idea. In other words, this mission is really here to teach us that. The next part is going to be where we get something more permanent. And we're going to try to get into what exactly is going to be the minimum measure of this next part. And it says, if he brought the threads two ends to the same side, in other words, the needle is now going to be passed through this cloth twice. The Mishnah says that it is considered an attachment regarding the laws for Tuma, and it is subject to Kalayim, and someone who undoes it on Shabbos is going to be liable. Now, So that is going to be considered where you have two pieces of fabric and let's say you put it in to go and pass it. You create a loop and you pass it down through the next part and the needle has now passed through. And even if you didn't pull the thread all the way through, you now have have done something where you've created shatnitz or a malaha in Shabbos or if something now is going to be temeh, you now have connected these two things. So let's say one cloth is going to be Tame and the second cloth is going to be Tahor, but you now have connected these two things. Now the 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 two cloths are regarded as Tame because you've connected the two. And the idea is that this is now going to be substantial enough where it is connected. In other words, just putting it through one time is not going to do it. But now when you're coming through a second time, that's going to be regarded now as being substantial enough to connect them. Now, Rabbi Yuda is going to dissent in this Mishnah, and he says that it's not considered an attachment until it's trebled. The idea that Rabbi Yuda has is that, that, well, the two passes is eventually going to come apart. And it's substantial, but it's not substantial enough. He's saying... Now when you've gone and passed this through three times, that's going to hold together. And that's true. It definitely will hold together than the other two. And he's saying at that point where it's going to be substantial, that's going to be where the the issues come about. Now, the Mishnah concludes with one last law about Shatnitz. It says something very, very mysterious, and it needs an explanation. And I'll give it to you by the Bill Nagon. It says a sack and a box combine for Kalayim. Now, will you say, what is that? And I stared at that and I said, what is that? So it's going to be like this. Let's say you have a box and let's say you have a sack and the person wants to wear the sack and he has joined the two pieces together with, um, you know, one's going to be linen, one's going to be wool and he's connected it. And now these are these are actually connected. And he's going to try to cover himself with the sack. And the idea is that, well, part of the Kalayim is on the box. And part of the Kalayim 
you know, again, part of the linen is over here, part of the wool is over here. They've been connected together. So even though you're going to be wearing the sack, which might even just be burlap, um, and now, you know, that's, that's going to be enough where if you're wearing something on one side and the other side is going to be uh, not used, it's still going to uh, be considered a single uh, garment, even though you're not using the entire thing. So that's going to be the idea where, you know, if one part of the garment is at one end, it's forbidden to cover yourself with the other end uh, that does not contain calium. But why? Because these two things have now been attached. And yes, you could say, well, I'm not, I'm not actually in the calium part. That, that's true, right? But you're wearing something that's been attached. And again, they're trying to pull this very funny sort of example because it's trying to teach you something that uh, even if you're utilizing one part that's not calium, if it's connected to something that is calium, then then you have a problem. And the Gemara is going to start off and it's going to say an interesting story about this stitching. Rabbi Hanina says that it is not considered a connection until the entire length of the thread extends to the other side of the cloth. In other words, that when you're going to do these two required passes, that the thread has to be pulled all the way through onto the other side of the cloth, basically until the knot, you know, hits the knot at the end of the thread, so that none of the thread is left protruding on one side. Uh, Rabbi Yanai objects, and he says to Rabbi Hanina, he says, go out of the study hall and read your verses there. Don't remain here to teach these incorrect rulings. And he says, we we learned in a Mishnah, if he brought the thread's two ends to the same side, it is considered an attachment. And now, according to you, says Rabbi Yanai, it should not be considered an attachment until the entire length of the thread descends to the other side of the cloth and the entire length comes back up. And in other words, he is fully passing through the thread. That's what Rabbi Hanina says. And Rabbi Yanai says, no, 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 no. It's enough that you've just started now. You've started that second loop through. That's enough. That's what Rabbi Yanai says. And he's saying that the Mishnah taught that Rabbi Yudah says until he trebles and says now, according to your teaching, it should not be considered an attachment until the entire length of the thread descends on the other side, the entire length comes back up and the length descends again. Rather, all that is necessary for the thread to pass through this cloth and that. In other words, Rabbi Yanai points out and says what Rabbi Yudah's ruling is and says, well, I mean, if you're going to say that it has to go all the way through, then certainly by Rabbi Yudah's point, it would have to go through three times all the way through. And we can see here that that's not the case for even Rabbi Yudah's view. And it, whether you're going to go by the Tanakama view or you're going to go by Rabbi Yudah's view, that it's not, it's just enough to pass it through a little bit, whether it's going to be the second time or the third time. And if you were going to say that you have to go through all the way through to the edge of the knot and all the thread has been pulled through when you're connecting these two panels of fabric, then even by Rabbi Yudah's point, you would have to go all the way through if you're going to say like what Rabbi Hanin is saying. And he's saying, if you're going to say that you have to go all the way through on the third one, well, then you would have already passed all the way through on the second one. And so that's going to be very odd because, you know, you've already, you've already fulfilled something according to yourself on the second one. How do you get to the third one? So that doesn't fit with what Rabbi Yanai is saying. Rabbi Yanai is pointing out and saying, no, 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 no. It's, not a, it's just enough that you've created that second loop and that's enough. Or even by Rabbi Yudah's point, Rabbi Yanai is saying, even by Rabbi Yudah's point, it's enough that you've now come through that third loop. It's just started and you don't actually have to pull through the threads all the way. And the idea is that it's enough to just create with this either double pass or single path, and you don't need to pull this and draw the thread through the entire cloth each time. Now, the Gemara talks about a brysa. It says that a thread that one threaded through a needle, even if the thread is knotted in both ends so that it cannot be removed without tearing, is not considered an attachment. So basically what this is is like this, 
is it's gonna the idea is gonna be that if you have a needle and the thread becomes teme or the needle becomes teme and the other one is to whore, it's not considered an attachment. Why? Because you're gonna break it apart. Because that's what you do when you're when you're sewing, right? You you sew your thread and then you you uh, you take off the needle and then you tie the two threads. So it's it's basically like this needle is not permanently affixed to the to the to the thread. And even if you have a knot on both ends, the knot is just going to be a temporary knot. That's the idea. And that's why it's not an attachment. And the Gemara says that if he sewed the thread into a garment and he did not remove the needle, the thread is considered attached to the garment, but it is not considered attached to the needle. So the thread that you've passed through is considered attached. And so if the thread was teme and the and the garment or the fabric was tahor, that's going to be an issue. And because now that thread is considered attached to the garment, you've sewn in something that is teme into something tahor, that's going to be an issue. But if you have a needle that is teme and the thread is tahor, the needle does not convey tuma to the thread. And that's going to be a rule that we, we learned before that one utensil does not contaminate another utensil or that the, the utensil that uh, is used to, to do something with a utensil, like to wrap a utensil. It doesn't, it doesn't convey tuma to it. Um, so you, you, have to, you have to do some other process to make it become teme. But just connecting a piece of thread to a teme needle doesn't, doesn't, make, it, doesn't make the thread teme. Why? Because you didn't make it a permanent attachment. Now, if you did make it a permanent attachment, where you permanently attached the thread to this teme needle, now the whole thing is going to be teme. But just coming in contact with it is not going to convey tuma unless there is a permanent fixture to it. So over here, the thread can be teme and the needle could be tahor, or vice versa, and one does not contaminate the other. But what we do care about is that attachment. When you go and you actually attach the thread into the garment, that's going to be the issue. And so passing through a teme needle through the garment doesn't make the, the garment have tuma to it. Uh, but if you do start to attach it uh, and, and you attach the, um, the thread into it, that's going to be the issue. And we, we know that also because that's also going to be the points where it starts to become issues for Shabbat or for Kalayim and Shatnas. So the mission has stated that if he brought the threads two ends to the same side, the claws are consider the clothes, the cloths are considered attached, both for things being for Tuma or also for Shatnas and Kalayim, and somebody who's going to undo a stitch is going to be liable. So Rabbi Yona and Rabbi Yose both say that the Mishnah says where the thread is tied at each end. And so when the mission is saying that the two ends of the thread are brought to the same side, it's meaning after the first penetration was performed, and now it's going to be the second pass made in the opposite direction. That's going to refer specifically to where afterwards the person tied the threads to ends. And uh, if he did not do so, the stretch is not going to last. The stitch is not going to last, says the Mara Fulda. In other words, the issue that we're coming up with here is, are, are we making a permanent connection with the stitch? And, you know, basically going through two times, that's going to be the issue. And is that going to be substantial enough? So the Gemara says that the statements of the following rabbis disagree with this ruling by Rabbi Yonah and Rabbi Yosa. And it says that Rabbi Ba quoted Rabbi Yirmiya in the name of Rav, where it says that someone who pulls the sides of a garment together on Shabbos is liable for sewing. And if one is liable for sewing, he's also going to tie the ends of the thread. And Rav should have said that he's liable for both sewing and tying. Evidently, Rav is holding that one is liable for sewing, even if he does not tie the ends of the thread. And that's what we're saying, right? We're saying that you've passed the thread through. You didn't actually tie the threads. And this comes up in, in Bavli and in Shabbos 75a, where over there it's talking about 
that it's in in Rav. Rav is saying it, but Rav doesn't say exactly which you're liable for. He doesn't say which malacha you're liable for. Are you going to be malacha having the malacha of sewing, or did you do tying? And in other words, if you're pulling the seam to be tight and you're pulling the two ends back together, did you do sewing, or uh, did you actually like um, uh, tie these together by by putting them together? In a way where you've tightened them, and so you know which which of these two would it be? And again, either way you're going to look at it. The idea is is that okay, even if you didn't knot the two together, that, that's Rob's point, right? Rob's point is that you don't actually need to knot the the end together. Rob Yona and Rabbi Yose saying no, you created a permanent structure where you've knotted each end. In other words, you've done your two passes and you've knotted the two, so you've made a fixture. Rob is saying, no, the, the stitch enough is, is enough that you can connect these two. It's not as permanent, but it's still a fixed. That's the idea. And the Mishnah states that Rav Yudah says that one must make three passes. What's the idea here? Rabbi uh, Simon says that Rabbi Yudah's reason is that by the means of the third pass is his work going to endure. In other words, Mara Fulda points out that it's the third pass through that's going to strengthen that last pass so that they hold without, and without that third pass, the first two are going to come apart. That might be some indication and insight into Rabbi Yon and Rabbi Yossi's idea that you have to knot each end. And the Gemara is going to analyze this view. It's going to say, what shall we say? that Rabbi Yudah holds and according to Rabbi Eliezer. In other words, the Gemara is going to consider this possibility uh, difficult as a halakha is not going to be in accordance with Rabbi Eliezer. And it says that we learn in the Mishnah there that Rabbi Eliezer says that one who weaves three threads at the beginning or one who, re one who th is going to thread to fabric that already is partially woven is going to be liable. In other words, that you have something that's already been woven and you're adding some more to it. And the Mara of Fulda explains it like this, that the sages are going to hold that even two threads woven in the beginning will last. And Rabbi Yudah in our Mishnah is holding that, that two passes of thread will not last, which, by the way, is going to be like Rabbi Eliezer's view. And the sages are basically holding that it's enough that it's going to be attached and connected and binding, and, and it's permanent enough. That's going to be the minimum measure. So in other words, did you need to knot these together? Uh, that's a good question, but uh, the, the idea is that it's these two passes of thread that are going to last enough. And the question, do you have to finally knot these two or not? That I'm not sure about. But it's enough that you have just the two passes through that it's going to be substantial enough. You don't need to have that third one. And again, the halacha is not going to be by Rabbi Eliezer. In this case, it's not going to be by Rabbi Yudah, who agrees with Rabbi Eliezer here, that saying that you know you need that third one to make the second and first one to be more substantial. And the Gemara now talks about Rabbi Yudah, you know, that maybe he doesn't necessarily agree with Rabbi Eliezer, and because it looks like, well, maybe these two views are the same, but it's going to point out that maybe not necessarily. So Rabbi Ola says that Rabbi Lazar's reason there regarding the laws of Shabbos is that by means of the third thread does the work endure, but the rabbis are maintaining that even two threads are going to endure, and Rabbi Yuda could agree with the rabbis that two threads will endure. But here, with less than three passes, it's only a loose connection which is not going to be subject to the Kalayim prohibition. So over the, the disagreement here is like this. Rabbi Eliezer is going to say that you need the, you need the three passes for either uh, for the laws of Shatnids or for Shabbos. And Rabbi Yudah is going to say, says Rabbi Ula, that you need, you need uh, two passes for Shabbos. Two is enough, like what the sages are saying. But regarding the three passes, that's going to be enough to be more than a loose connection. And that's going to be enough to subject it to the Kalayim prohibition according to Rabbi Yudah. Again, the sages don't hold that way. They're going to say over here in Shabbos and over here in Kalayim laws, 
it's going to be basically the same. If it's even, you know, loosely connected but attached, that's going to be enough. And the Mishnah states that the sack and the box will combine for Kalayim. The Gemara is going to elaborate on that. Rabbi Simon says in the name of Rabbi Yeshua Bain Levi, they taught this only regarding a sack, implying not regarding a basket. So a sack is going to combine with a box because people are going to, says the Rosh Cerulio, sometimes attach these two items to each other, and they did not stand so readily to be disconnected. And a basket, on the other hand, is not commonly attached to a box. And so if somebody did attach to it like this, it would, it would be made in a way to come apart. And according to this explanation, the reason to be more lenient with the basket and allow the basket is going to be because it could be carried on your shoulder or uh, it could be uh, where the basket's going to be, um, you know, made to come right off. And it's not going to be like a permanent fixture. But over here, we're talking about a sack and a box that it will be. Now, why would you be dealing with a sack and a box? Well, maybe you're gathering fruit. And so this is a, something the guy is going to be carrying so that he can put the fruit in the box and, and you know, walk with it and go with it. And, you know, it's like, uh, it's like sometimes people will wear when they're doing street work, like if they're fixing the road for like the city, you'll see they'll wear like an orange vest. And they have clothes underneath it. Maybe this guy is wearing this burlap sack with a box attached to it. And he's going to put on the sack to walk around as a garment. And then he has the box behind him that's connected to it so he can put the fruit in it. And then when he's done collecting it, he takes it off. And you have a box full of fruit. And you have the garment that's there. So the Brisa says that it was found, it teaches otherwise, that a basket, a sack, and a box will combine for a Kalayim prohibition. And it says then that tents are not subject to Kalayim. Now, that's that's a Hiddish. In other words, this last ruling about tents, this is seem, going to seem to be incidental to what we were talking about with the sack. And the idea is that if a tent is made with both linen and wool, uh, you're still permitted to, to sit in it. And the prohibition of it shall not come apply you uh, shall not come upon you applies only when the cloth is directly on a person like a garment, not when it's hovering over a person. Um, and even if, by the way, it's going to be giving you warmth and it's going to be above you, but it's not actually on you and it didn't come on you and you're not wearing it. That's the insight by Rabbi Kanievsky to explain it. And regarding the next part, it's going to ask a question. It's going to say, Rabbi Yermia inquired and says, a father and a son, what is the law as to whether they combine for the climb prohibition? And of course, you're asking the same thing. What's the case? And the Gemara says, what's the case? And he says that he, the father, is wearing a wool garment, and he, the son, is wearing a linen garment. And he took a strap of wool and wound it around both of them. So in other words, is this going to be like the box connected to the burlap? Now, the idea is that you know if you have a sack that's going to combine with a box and you've connected it now, um, you know what you know what what's going on over here and why is that going to be like the son wrapped up with the father, and you know the is this really a connection between you know the father and the son where one is wearing wool and one is wearing linen is that really going to make a uh, client prohibition or not, and the the question seems to be relevant even if the strap is not made of wool or linen, but rather some other material like leather. And Rabbi Yermia's question, is it going to apply to any two people, not just a father and son? Rabbi Yermia chose a father and son as an example because it's common for a father who wishes to carry his little son to bind them together to prevent the son from falling down. And alternatively, the case is where the father and his son are walking side by side and the father is going to bind the son to him so that the son doesn't wander off and get lost. Is that going to now be a connection? And Rabbi Haggai is going to inquire and say that a person himself, what is the law as to whether he combines for the Kalayim prohibition? And the Gemara again asks, what's the case? And he says that he's wearing a wool sock on one foot and a linen sock on the other foot. 
So in other words, are we going to consider the two socks that are going to be connected by the fact that they're going to be on one body as enough? And the Gemara answers, Rabbi Yossi says, and says, now, is this one biting? In other words, the socks are not connected. And the Gemara says it's unnecessary to say that it's not kalayim. In other words, that the key idea is that the, the, the materials have to be connected to one another. And so then you have a third question. It says, if someone had wounds on his hand and he placed a wool rag bandage on one of the wounds and a linen bandage on one of the wounds, on another one of the wounds, what's the law? Rabbi Yosei says, and says, now, is this biting? And says, why the bandages are not attached? And you have no case that is prohibited unless there is biting. Now, what if you have a wool bandage and you have an oozing wound and now you have a linen bandage that's put over it and the ooze goes and it you know, has these like leukoplasts, which are these like things to start to seal a wound that the body excretes. And now it's dampened the wool one and it's gone into the linen one and it connects these now together. Well, that's going to be biting. You've now have connected these, and you know the the liquid is that seeps out of a wound is now going to like you know crust over and start to crust these together. That's going to be an issue. But where you have even on one hand on one wound, one is going to be uh, you know one is going to be wool, and there's another wound on the hand, and that's going to be linen, and there's no overlap, and these two aren't biting. That's not going to be a problem. Again, why is this here? This is trying to teach that when you have these permanent fixtures or you've created the two pieces into a single unit, that's going to be where we get an issue. And that concludes the second Kaliyam. And I want to point out, again, one more deep idea that all of the second Kaliyam is about Bereshit. You know, there's a Midrash Rabbah that talks about how one of the things that we're supposed to study is the creation. And we're supposed to look at Bereshit. Also, we're supposed to look at Halaha, And we're supposed to look at the Tanakh. And we're supposed to look at Scripture. And we're supposed to look at Halachot. But one of the other things that is a, it says that somebody should be aware of and look at and study a bit is going to be the creation. And the Chazanish, in his book, in the introduction in Kalayim, his Kalayim book, named after Kalayim, says that, in thinking about the laws of Kalayim, we're thinking about Hashem's dominion over the creation. And that's really what we saw here. And, and I want to just point out that when we were talking in chapter 9 about the burial shrouds and you know hints about resurrection of the dead in chapter 9 here, well, that's going to be where Hashem does have mastery over the creation and over his his creatures and you know the ability to you know, not be limited by anything and to recreate the human being as, you know, to come back alive is total dominion over it. And I want to point out that in the beginning when we were talking about the garden plots and Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi is talking in, in chapter one about the garden plots and how we have the yud K vav K embedded in the long form of the word Zorea which has a yud, a vav, and a he, and that that is going to be how we learn, according to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, that you can put in six seeds into a garden plot, according to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, and embedded in there, of course, is the wink, wink, and nod, nod, nudge, nudge, that the seed grows with the help of the yud, ke, vav, ke, and has Hashem's dominion over the creation, and we see the seed and the seed, in other words, the resurrection of the dead, when you come back up, it's going to be like you are a seed that grows again. And over here, we're talking about planting the seeds with the yud ke vav ke and Hashem's help in all of the creation. And it's not just form and material, but that there is soul and there's Hashem's help in the running of the world and the order of the world and the creation of the world. And one of the deep ideas here is that the Bria does have a structure. Things are made male and female. Things are made according to its kind. And that's something that in today's day we have to remember. You know, there's a lot of uh, science that now is pushing in toward 
you know, laboratory things where we're going to create new species in laboratories or maybe with viruses and germs and, you know, testing in, you know, funny ways like what some conspiracy theorists say what happened at the Wuhan lab, which might, may or may not be true. I don't know. I'm not a scientist and, you know, I'm just learning Gamara. But my point is this, that, that everybody should be very aware when tampering with the creation. And we have a natural order, and things are created according to its kind, and we should respect that. And that concludes the second client. Have a great day.